So I want to talk tonight about how to be courageous. Uh, If you hadn't noticed, the world is a bit topsy-turvy at the moment. Uh, And as, as you all are entering into adulthood, entering, you know, beginning your careers, beginning, um, uh, you're, you're, you're entering into adulthood. Um, and you, and you think about how, um, uh, the, the generations have this interesting handoff where, um, every 20 or so years, uh, the young bucks are replenished and you all are entering, uh, the young buck territory. You are entering the, the, the season when, um, the way the world is, is going to be handed off to you. Uh, the, the, the mess that is the world is going to be your mess uh, to, to do something with. The, the untamed um, uh, hurly-burly of the world and the circumstances that the world is right now, um, ta-da, you, got, you were born in the year you were born, you're coming of age in, in, in the year of our Lord, 2023, when people don't know what a man is, what a woman is. They don't know that you can't just keep printing money. They don't know diddly squat. Congratulations. This is your adulthood. Now, uh, many Zoomers are saying, oh, look at the mess that the the boomers, the millennials are leaving to us. Um, a, A global pandemic that was crazy and now you're... Uh, you had uh, uh, your final years of high school, early years of college, were alone in solitude. Wear a mask, get jabbed six times. Don't ask questions; we'll throw you in jail. Congrats! This is your adulthood. You can either mope about it, complaining about previous generations' idiocy. Okay, boomer. Or you can say, as uh, we might paraphrase Proverbs 23, you can look at the mess that the, is the world right now and you can say, you know what? You know what would make this really interesting? Is if there was a lion or a bear thrown in to make it more interesting. Uh, the the, the uh, Proverbs 23 says that the fool, um, let me just read it here. Proverbs 23, 6, 16 Uh, the sluggard says, well, that isn't it. I must have put down the wrong reference there. Well, the sluggard, I, I, I know it roughly from heart. The, the sluggard says, there's a lion in the way. I'm not going to go out. Uh, I'm, it's too scary. There's a lion out there. And he stays in bed. You should look at the mess of the world and say, God, why don't you up the ante? Throw in a lion or a bear just to make it worth our while. So you live in a time that calls for courage. But courage isn't a pill that you take. It's not a prescription that your doctor can give you. It's not a class at a Christian liberal liberal arts college. Uh, Courage isn't found in posting edgy memes. Courage is the steadfast stance of faith. God is your God, so believe it, and then live it. Now, uh, and, and, and I'll, I'll, I'll give some pauses here throughout, and you can feel free to ask questions or say, yeah, what about this, or what about those boomers and millennials who ruined our adulthood, our prospects for savings, our prospects for owning our own house someday, that sort of thing. Uh, but um, So feel free to, to chime in if there's anything that comes to your mind as we go along here. But, but we first, if we're, if we're talking about how to be courageous, we should first ask ourselves, where does discouragement come from? Why is, why is it that we're such an impotent and powerless generation? Why is it that there's such feebleness, such lack of courage, such lack of a spine, uh, uh, that, that there's Um, there's courage and there's defiance when it comes to all manner of foolishness. Um, The the constant drumbeat, which you've probably heard um, in your growing up years, that the world is going to end in five or 12 years if if we don't um, raise the taxes on the wealthiest. And the world is going to turn into an an inferno. Uh, And and you'll see defiance of, of, um, of the powers that be in that respect. 
Or you'll see, um, we need to, uh, you'll see uh, marches for, uh, we should be able to uh, abort our, our unborn babies. My body, my choice. We, we see all sorts of courage, but in all the wrong directions. And from within the church, and from within the Christian community, we should ask, why is there such discouragement? Why is there such feebleness, spinelessness, limp-wristedness? And there are a few ways in which staunchness can turn into stench, in, into cowardice. First, discouragement, and if you, if you look at your life and you say, I'm a, I'm a coward, I'm, I'm pushed around, I'm insecure, I'm fearful of what people will think about me if I open my mouth and say what I believe about, uh, about how God's word uh, should uh, be brought to bear upon our cult- culture, I'm fearful or I'm timid or I'm, I'm shy or I'm, I'm discouraged about the way the world is and the prospects of the world and, and all that. There's a couple things that cause that discouragement. First, discouragement can arise from unconfessed sin. Discouragement can arise from unconfessed sin. Are you hiding sin in your heart or in your life? The cure, of course, is to confess your sin to God and to those you've sinned against, and then sin no more. In the battle against darkness, harboring evil or disobedience in your own heart is doing the enemy's work. It's doing the enemy's dirty work for him. Think of the Lord's warning in in Leviticus 26. You can turn to Leviticus 26. And I do have this reference right. Uh, Leviticus 26, 14. So this is after all of the great blessings that God is promising to Israel, if they keep God's word, if they keep his commands, if they walk in all of his ways, blessing, blessing, blessing. It's going to be wonderful. And then it transitions in verse 14 to here's what happens if you forsake the ways of the Lord. If you, if you walk in sin, if you embrace your sin, if you trifle with your sin and then you, you feed it, you nourish it, you nurture it, and then you come to love and embrace and uh, throw parades for your sin. Here's what will happen, verse 14 through 17. But if you will not hearken, listen uh, unto me, unto the Lord, and will not do all these commandments, and if you shall despise my statutes, or if your soul abhor my judgments, so that you will not do all my commandments, but you break my covenant, I will also do this unto you. I will even appoint over you terror, consumption, and the burning egg, ag, I think I mispronounced that one. That shall consume the eyes and, and cause sorrow of heart. And you shall sow your seed in vain, for your enemies shall eat it. And I will set my face against you, and you shall be slain before your enemies. And they that hate you shall reign over you. And this is the, the thing I want you to pay attention to. You shall flee when none pursueth you. Do you see the link that if you won't hearken to God's word, if you despise his statutes, if you uh, abhor the judgments of the Lord, what God says is good and right, what God says is evil and wrong, if you abhor all that, what will follow is fleeing when no one is pursuing you. Cowardice. Discouragement. And so, uh, if you find yourself fearful, if you find yourself discouraged, if you find yourself um, uh, uh, unwilling or unable to uh, speak up and stand up for your faith, you need to see, is there any wicked way in me? Have I, have I harbored sin in my own heart and in my own life? But secondly, discouragement can arise from a similar but a bit different um, uh, area. So if you go to Proverbs chapter 1, we, we learn here that, Discouragement can arise from saying yes to going along with sinners. In other words, you might say, well, I'm not as bad as that Leviticus passage. I'm not not quite there. I'm not abhorring the Lord's judgments or anything like that. But are you, you might say, you might not be doing anything sinful per se, or so you argue with yourself. But you keep finding yourself keeping company with a very technical term, 
knuckleheads, and idiots. Uh, you, you find yourself in, in the, the sort of company that, with the sort of companions that always seem to be magnetically drawn to um, dumb things, uh, to, uh, to, to frittering away their time or their energy or their chastity. Uh, you find yourself keeping company with knuckleheads and idiots. Proverbs 1, uh, Solomon's instruction in verse 10 to, to his son is rather striking. His instruction is the cure if this describes you. If you've just gone along and you found yourself drifting along with, with fools, Solomon exhorts you there in verse 10, chapter 1, verse 10. He says, My son, if sinners entice thee, and this is what you should underline in your Bible, you should put it on a, a big poster board and put it on your mirror, you should uh, set a reminder on your iPhone to like remind you of it like 10 times a day and have like a reminder pop up. Um, consent thou not. Or do not consent. Don't go along. If you want to learn to be a courageous person, you need to be the sort of person that even with good and godly friends, you're not easily steered. You're not easily drawn away into foolishness. You must learn to say no. When, when the evildoers, when the sinners entice you, you need to be able to say no. Flat out no. Don't worry about being nice when sinners entice you. No to your own heart. If it's drawing you away, that was the first point. And then no to the enticements of evildoers. So those are, those are the first two areas where discouragement uh, can arise from. Any, any questions or comments on, on any of that before we plow forward? I'm sure something will come to you sooner or later. A third source of discouragement comes from external trials. And I think this one is a bit trickier for us to wrap our brains around. It may be, like I, I began with, it may be that you look around you and you think, I didn't ask for any of this. I didn't ask to be born in, when were you guys, most of you born? Like 2000, 1998, 2004. 2004. Who's the oldest student age person here? 1990, 2001. 2001, is that the oldest? Do we have anybody higher other than Matt? Um, <laughs> you're, the old, you're the old geezer in the room, all right. so. You'd say, I didn't choose to be born in the aughts. That's what they're called, by the way. You didn't ask for any of this. You were minding your own business. You didn't ask to be cast in a dystopian novel about tyrannical mad scientists and politicians wanting to run experiments on the populace, you and the whole populace, while you wear a VR headset in a pod, being fed plant-based meat goo, and, and sedated with AI kink porn generated specifically for you. You didn't ask for any of this nonsense that's just deluging our culture. And so the trials which arise and, and face us from outside, uh, without your doing, can really discourage you. You can look at it all and say, but I didn't do any of that. Uh, whether it's a health, um, a health trial or a financial trial or just the trial of living in the world in the year 2023. Banks about to collapse, so they say. Balloons flying overhead. Where did they come from? We don't know. Where did they go? Apparently in the Atlantic Ocean. Well, what do we do with all this? I didn't ask for any of it. I, I can't do anything about any of these things, it would seem. But you must not, for any reason, make excuses. Here be dragons, demons, devils, and dictators. You can either be an NPC, a non-player character, if you know your video game lingo, or you can imitate Christ and open prison doors through gospel fidelity and gospel proclamation. As Isaiah 61 uh, de de declares about what Christ's ministry would be in which we should um, imitate and carry on, Isaiah 61.1 says this. 
The Spirit of the Lord God is upon me. This is the passage that Jesus, if you remember uh, in, in the Gospel of Luke, he, he reads in the synagogue there in Nazareth. Jesus reads this, and uh, the Spirit of the Lord God is upon me because the Lord hath anointed me to preach good tidings unto the meek. He hath sent me to bind up the brokenhearted, to proclaim liberty to the captives, and the opening of the prison to them that are bound. You didn't ask for any of this to happen. And if you deal with the discouragement that comes from unconfessed sin, and you deal with the discouragement that comes from just being uh, uh, led by the nose or led around by uh, foolish and sinful friends, if you successfully overcome the discouragements there, and then you turn and you look at the, the smoking ruin that is the year of our Lord 2023, or so it would seem, the way to overcome that discouragement is to imitate your Lord. To say that in the midst of, of the Roman occupation, in the midst of an Israel plagued by demon possession, Christ comes and says, we're opening the prison doors. We're, we're, we're binding up the brokenhearted. We're proclaiming liberty to the captives. It, um, it reminds me of that scene in The Horse and His Boy. And I'm going to mention The Hobbit in a second. So you're just going to get all sorts of Tolkien and Lewis here in a second. Where the horse and his boy, where Shasta, if you're familiar with the story, he, he gets separated from his friends and his companions in the, in the city of Tashban, and he, and he sees the Narnian um, um, royalty parading through the streets, and it describes them that they look like they're, they walk with freedom and liberty. It's the first time he's seen people walking, uh, ready to, it says that they're ready to be friendly with anyone and not to give a fig for anyone who isn't. And Shasta is inspired and says, those are the sort of people I want to be with. If you understand the liberty with which Christ has set you free, you can face this world and all of its trials and declare that the gospel of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ sets the prisoner free. I am free, I am clean, because the blood of Christ has cleansed me and washed me. And so we go and we declare this liberty. Now, let me go on a little rabbit trail to Middle Earth for a moment. But before I do, any questions, comments, concerns, conundrums, queries, or kerfuffles? You're ready for the rabbit trail to Middle Earth, I see. There's a wonderful line in The Hobbit where it describes Bilbo entering Smaug's lair for the first time. He had already faced many dangers. So if you know the story, he was already, uh, by the time he gets to the, the Lonely Mountain and is about to enter Smaug's lair, he had already faced the cave trolls. That's pretty scary for a little, little hobbit to face. He had already um, been captured by the goblins in the, in the, the Misty Mountains and then uh, got separated from the dwarves and Gandalf and uh, outsmarts Gollum and the riddles in the dark, one of the best chapters in all of literature. Um, he, he freed them from the spiders and they there's all sorts of, he, he had set them free from the elves, which had captured them. And, and so he'd already had all sorts of exploits. He'd already been pretty impressive, um, sort of lived up, uh, uh, or, or exceeded the expectations for him. He'd already faced many dangers and, and acquitted himself nobly and courageously, we might say. But the seemingly small step from the safety of the tunnel into the danger of Smaug's treasure room was described this way. Tolkien describes it this way. I love this. It was at this point, so at the end of the secret tunnel, and he's about to enter into the, the treasure chamber where Smaug had his lair, the, the, the dragon. It was at this point that Bilbo stopped. Going on from there was the bravest thing he ever did. What? Are you kidding me? That was the bravest thing he ever did? And it says, but the tremendous things that happened afterwards were as nothing compared to it. He fought the real battle in the tunnel alone before he ever saw the vast danger that lay in wait. It was that small step of courage, according to Tolkien. Tolkien points that out. That's in the narrative. That's, that's in the story. That the bravest thing Bilbo did was not all these great exploits, but it was the small step of of courage, a tiny one even, one that might not seem that important to anybody watching. It was that small step of courage that enabled great feats of history, a turning of the tide. In other words, faithfulness in a thousand daily duties 
is what leads to great exploits. If you want to do great things, if you want to make great conquests for the, for the gospel of the Lord, if you want to accomplish great things in life for the glory of God, it's not going to come by just daydreaming about doing great things. It's going to come by taking a small step of courage into the dragon's lair. In other words, you aren't born courageous. You become courageous by doing the good things you know you ought to do, even when no one sees it and fleeing the evil things you ought not to do, even if everyone is telling you otherwise. Any thoughts or comments thus far? Feel free to chime in. This is your moment. This is your time. We can all stare awkwardly at each other. <laughs> all right. That's your chance. We'll keep going. So where does courage come from? Scripture teaches us where true courage comes from. Uh, you can flip over uh, Isaiah 35. Wonderful, um, triumphant passage as Isaiah is anticipating the, the glorious things to come as when the Messiah comes, the wilderness will turn into uh, a, an oasis It'll bloom, the wilderness will bloom and blossom with fruit. If you, if you look in verse 3 and 4, uh, Isaiah prophetically charges the people of God in this way. It says, Strengthen ye the weak hands, and confirm the feeble knees. Say to them that are of a fearful heart, Be strong, fear not. Behold, your God will come with vengeance, even God with a recompense. He will come and save you. Inward strength then and fortitude arise from eyes fixed on Christ. This passage in Isaiah is foretelling the coming of the new covenant mercies, which Christ would usher in. If you look at some of the other language in that chapter, it's the lame men will leap, the, the, the tongue of the dumb will sing, and um, the eyes of the blind shall be opened. It, it's prophesying of Christ's ministry. On the highway there shall be, in verse 8, and, and a way, and it shall be called the way of holiness, and the unclean shall not pass over it, but it shall be for those, the wayfaring men, though fools shall not err therein. No lion or beast or dragon will be upon this path, and the ransom of the Lord will return and come to Zion with songs and everlasting joy upon their heads, and they shall obtain joy and gladness, and sorrow and sighing will flee away. This is prophesying of what Christ's ministry and redemptive work would usher into the world. He's foretelling the coming of the new covenant mercies which Christ would bring in. And the exhortation to the people of God in, in anticipating that great deliverance that God through Christ would bring, a, bring about, the exhortation is to strength. It's to strengthen. Uh, it's, it's strength in the context of sweeping reformation which his redeeming work would bring about. You can't stand firm on toothpick stilts of self-determination or self-righteousness. It's not just Jordan Peterson's, you know, make your bed and that's it. That, that's the, the, the pathway to greatness or to, um, uh, or to courage. Now, it's not to say you shouldn't make your bed. You should make your bed. That'd make your mama proud. But, but it's not just self-will, pull yourself up by your bootstraps. You could, you could become the most disciplined person around and yet, if your heart has not been made new, if you've not set and fixed your eyes upon this redeeming, life-giving work which Christ would usher in, it's all going to be uh, on, on toothpick stilts. Your self-determination or self-righteousness isn't enough to hold you up. The only solid ground is that God, in Christ, has forgiven all your sins. You're clean in Christ. Uh, it, God in Christ reckons you dead indeed into sin. And he then commands you in Romans 6, reckon yourselves to be dead indeed unto sin. Say about yourself in your baptism into Christ, say about yourself what God says about you. God in Christ has forgiven all your sins and given you his spirit in order that you might walk in all righteousness and courage. Paul exhorts the Corinthian church this way, watch ye, stand fast in the faith, I love this. Quit you like men. Be strong. 1 Corinthians 16, 13. He says, bride of Christ, 
man up. This steadfast courage arises from those who know and believe that they have been buried with Christ and raised into the life of resurrection, which Christ secured for them and which the Spirit assures them of. One saint of old said it this way. I love this. My time is short. I must be up and doing. I must go briskly on with my work, leaving it to my Lord to find me strength for it and success in it. Isn't that great? Yeah. I don't have any time to figure out where I'm going to get the strength or the courage or the stamina for the task that God has given me, for the mess of the world that is 2023, that you have been tasked to, to be faithful in, in uh, getting married, having kids, raising them, uh, pr- uh, producing um, businesses, and, and, and uh, being faithful uh, worshipers of the Lord Jesus and, and worshiping wherever God places you, uh, building the church, building the kingdom wherever he places you. You don't have time to figure out where you're going to get the strength from. You must be up and doing. Get to it. Stop twiddling your thumbs. Stop sitting on your hands. Be up and doing. He says, I must go briskly on with my work, leaving it to my Lord to find me the strength for it and success in it. His blessing I expect here and forever, not for anything I have done. And yet I would labor as hard as if heaven was to be the reward of my labors. And so, As the old hymn reminds us, you fearful saints, fresh courage take. Guess what? You've got a lifetime of hardship ahead of you. There's all sorts of difficulties and trials and sorrows and and, and political turmoil and and wars and, 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 and crises throughout the world. You've got a lifetime of hardship ahead. Welcome to planet Earth. Welcome to this planet that is in high rebellion to its maker, but through Christ, uh, it's been, the ownership of this world has been handed over to him and he is remaking it all. He is uh, bringing all into subjection to his kingship. So yes, you may have a lifetime of hardship ahead of you. Don't bemoan it. Don't give way to discouragement. Rise to the occasion. Play the man. Let Christ be seen in how you keep your room, how you budget, in your browsing history, your words to friends and strangers. As one saint of yesteryear wrote, would you have dauntless courage in all coming trials and persecutions? If you want to be courageous, what's his answer for us? Die unto sin. Hold fast the covenant and promises of God and let Christ be all in all to you. He who would not be filled with shame must first count the cost of all he undertakes. God's word and spirit are always on the side of truth and duty and may infallibly re- may be infallibly relied on. The enemy has no arts nor devices that have not been thwarted a thousand times. Isn't that a great line? The enemy has no arts nor devices that have not been thwarted a thousand times. Everything that's happening right now in the world Satan's tried before and failed. And in fact, his power has been overthrown. 1 John 3 tells us the reason the Son of God appeared was to overthrow the works of the devil, was to destroy the works of the devil. This quote finishes up. He can, the enemy can be beaten, for he has been vanquished. Let's pray. Our God and Father, we thank you uh, for your word to us. We thank you that by it you... You build us up, you encourage us, you give us strength for the tasks, the, the, the hardships that um, await us yet ahead. Lord, I pray that by your spirit, you would fill us uh, with strength for the task, uh, the difficulties that are right, right ahead of us and the difficulties that are further down the road. I pray that you would give us grace to confess unconfessed sin. I pray that you would give us strength to not go along with evildoers. And I pray that you would give us courage uh, with the trials that, that will surround us, that will beset us. Lord, we offer it all up to you in Jesus' name. Amen.